All right, so we are starting off with chapter one, all right? Um, just a reminder, I am recording, so if you don't want to be heard, just let me know, raise your hand, and I will mute this before um, you talk. Not like you're most likely going to be heard, because the microphone's right here. But anyway, chapter one, computers and information processing. So, the first thing that the book wants to talk about is recognizing computers. Now, I would like to believe, if I asked you guys what a computer looks like, you all could identify what I would call a traditional computer. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that those are the only things out there that are a computer. All right. Up in the top right hand corner, I've got some pretty, what I'm going to call obvious forms of computer. On the far right in that image with the fun RGB fans, you've got a desktop computer. That might qualify some of you as a gaming computer, which is perfectly fine. Um, Normally, the ones with RGB would qualify as gaming. You know, I don't know why, but that's what some people think make them gaming. In the middle of the screen, we've got a nice, beautiful little laptop. All right. Um, and then on the left-hand side of the screen, we've got a little tablet going on, which, again, I think most of you would probably qualify as a computer of some sort. Um, now, there are obviously varying forms of all of these. All right. Uh, my favorite desktop that I've ever opened up was one my dad's office had. And I opened it up, and I'm like, Where's the power supply? Why is this case so empty? And it was basically laptop hardware in a desktop tower. <laughs> so the motherboard was this little itty bitty thing. There was one hard drive, a DVD drive. The power supply was an external power brick. I'm just like, why is this case so big? And I'm convinced it was purely to make you feel like you're getting more for your money type of thing. But anyway, um, a computer, according to your book, is a programmable machine that converts raw data into useful information. Now, what is data? All right. Is data text? Yeah, data could be text. Could be pictures. Could be sounds. It could be images. It could be zeros and ones. All right. Temperature data. Data could basically be anything that we're putting on the computer. Um, and then we have, so we have data, and then we have information. Now, in your mind, and I overall agree with you, you may go, data information. They're probably talking roughly about the same thing. And yes, they are rather close. The one difference is information has been processed. So it is a, in a useful form. So it's something that you can actually deal with. If I give you a bunch of data, that's just a whole bunch of zeros and ones, you're like, I don't read computer. <laughs> All right. But if I give you information, it's converted that zeros and ones from that file on your computer into text that you can actually read. All right. That's what the big differentiation here is between data and computer, uh, data and information. All right, um, but not a whole lot going on. Computers, they, as I said, programmable machines. So while we're talking, think of things that are programmable. All right, what other computers are out there other than your PC that sits in front of you? Calculator. That probably is a computer. It has a small little microchip in it. Anyone else? Does your cell phone qualify as a computer? Probably. How about if you have a separate camera? Not your cell phone camera, a separate camera. Most of them probably would qualify. Now, if you're like, Greg, I'm a photographer, I'm analog, then maybe you don't have a computer in your camera, all right? That may be all springs and dials and things with actual film. You might not have an actual computer in that. I'll give you that one, all right? But a lot of cameras. If you have a separate GPS device in your car, I know many of you are like, either A, I don't have a car, or B, I'm like, why would I have a separate device for GPS? My phone doesn't. And my answer is, lack of cell phone service. All right. I have one in my glove box. Couldn't tell you the last time I actually turned it on. But if you're ever in the middle of the woods and you don't have cell phone service, and you're like, how do I get out of here? Having that little GPS in that glove box is going to save me a lot of time. All right. And we do, here in Hagerstown, live in the world of trees. So. I, I was driving through Katoshin Wildlife, or, you know, out, uh, east of us, and my phone lost cell phone service. Not normally a big deal, right? It's already navigating. We're doing just fine. I lost GPS on my phone. And I'm like, all right, this is kind of interesting. And then all of a sudden, the screen starts moving on me, and I don't have GPS. I'm like, what's going on? I am convinced that Google has programmed Android that's like, we're tracking your acceleration data in your phone. So we think you're here. And all of a sudden, it's like, turn right. And I'm like, there's no road there, Google. <laughs> all right. So a little tangent there. But anyway. Yeah. So GPS is phones, cameras. Um, 
some clocks will even have will be qualified as computers. All right. Um, Internet of Things. Anything that is an Internet of Thing, if it's connected to the Internet, it's got some sort of processing power on board. All right. So there are well, nearly an infinite number of things out there that would qualify as computers at this point in time. Um, every day things get more and more. Um, ex I'm going to call it exciting. That's probably not the right word, but more things are becoming computerized. I'm not so sure that's a good thing. All right. My car, my old old car, uh, Chevy Ex um, Equinox, used to email me monthly the health of my car. Be like, your tire pressure is this. Your oil life is this. Everything else checks out. And I'm like, kind of weird. A little creepy that my car is emailing me, but okay. No longer on that car, but that's a different game. All right. Sorry, a little, some tangents there. Um, ubiquitous computing. That's the next one. So Ubiquort. This is also known as invisible computing. Um, so this is technology that just recedes into the background. So again, like your car. You don't necessarily think of your car as a computer, but most cars nowadays are computers, unless, again, you've gone really old school with it, and you've ripped out the, the fuel injection, most likely fuel injection. Some fuel injection is mechanically injected, um, or whatever else. You're going to have a computer in your car. In fact, that's one of the things that caused car sales, the, sky, uh, the prices to skyrocket and the, the availability to plummet during COVID was those computer chips. Companies could not get those computer chips to actually build the cars. Supposedly, I don't actually know if it's true, there were lots and lots of cars in the manufacturing facilities. Like, the parking lots are just full of them. And they were all just waiting for computer chips. Like, the frames, the wheels, the windshield wipers, everything was fine. Yep. So, um, the quality of the chips might have dropped because they're like, well, this one doesn't quite meet spec, but we'll send it out anyway and hope for the best. All right. Um, the other thing that some car manufacturers are doing, and kind of off topic, they were shipping cars without features. So it's like, well, this car can sit in our parking lot here for the next who knows how long, or we can sell it and say, when we get the part in stock, you can bring it in and we'll add it, and now you'll have Bluetooth to your car. <laughs> Which, I mean, like, I'm kind of like, I'm on board with that. You know, I'm getting a car now, I'll give you Bluetooth in a few months. Okay, I can accept that. But anyway, um, ubiquitous computing. Um, so it's technology that's so prevalent that it may not be identified as a computer. So some examples here. Digital signage. How many of you guys would have thought, like, you know, driving down the highway, you know, you see the sign, the, the billboard that's just rotating? Would you have thought that was a computer? I mean, thinking about it now, it's like, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> but just driving down the road, you're like, oh, okay, that billboard's changing. Okay. Just not really something that I would have contemplated in my mind. All right. Another good one, um, your credit cards. All right. And if you have a credit card that can just be tapped to pay, that's not just a little magnetic bar barcode anymore or magnetic strip. Now there is a little computer chip inside your credit card that stores information, and it actually gets power from the terminal that you're scanning it on. That's why you're, you're, there's no battery in your, your, your credit card. All right? You're just like, okay, let me just take my card out. I have one, you just tap it on the machine, it goes ding, and then it you know, goes to the internet and goes, yep, all right, have a nice day. No inserting, no swiping, just tap and you're done. Not gonna lie, huge fan of that. All right. um, smart device is another one, but I think those probably hit, kind of hit up. All right, next up, IOT. Anyone know what IOT is? I think I've already said it once today. The Internet of Things. All right. In your guys' guess, and I'm looking for a show of hands here, how many of you have some sort of Internet of Thing device in your house, in your person, whatever? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven of you guys? Well, a little, little under half. I would guess that number is a whole lot higher than you all think. All right. My watch is a smart watch. It's Android. Technically, Internet of Thing. It takes my heart rate. It uploads it to Google Survey or to Google Server. It's technically an Internet connected device sending data. All right. Um, so yes, Internet of Things. It, it's a connection of physical things to the Internet. That's what we're really talking about here. Um, if any of you guys have any um, smart outlets at home, that would be an Internet of Thing um, smart thermostat. That one might be one that's flying under the radar. My parents love their smart thermostat. They go on vacation, they're driving home, it's 90-something degrees outside, and they're like, we're two hours away. Turn the air conditioning on. 
and that way the house is nice and cool when they get there. So, um, yeah. So, some purposes of those IoT. My Chevy Equinox would technically have qualified as an IoT device. <laughs> All right, um, so for locating devices, all right, any of you guys have the Apple AirTags for tracking things? Or um, what's the other one? Can't think of the other tag name. It was another tag, another company that created a tag that was Bluetooth that would uh, help you locate your devices. Uh, monitoring something, okay, temperature outside. Um, if you have a weather station at your house that actually connects to the internet, that would be an internet of thing. Um, or controlling something. We talked about outlets or HVAC systems. So. Anything that, any device that's kind of connected to the internet that is either sending information, receiving information for the purposes of control or display or something like that, technically an internet of thing. All right, set. My Chevy Equinox, technically. I just legitimately thought about that now as I'm talking right now because I've already been talking about my cars, old car so much. Um, so that one's just kind of a weird one to me. Um, so next we move into embedded computers. All right. These are a specialized computer. Traditionally, they're going to be part of another, another device, such as a car, gas pump, or a home appliance. All right. Um, your Keurig coffee maker, if you have one of those at home, probably has an embedded computer in it. All right. Um, I think they really used to, because I think some of them have like a little sensor that detects the, the actual Keurig brand coffee cup. Um, so that way you didn't use off-brand Keurig cups and screw up your coffee maker somehow. No, that wasn't just an attempt to make you buy our product. <laughs> All right. But had a little computer, said, not our coffee, we're not going to brew it for you. And you could just get very mad at Keurig for that one. Pretty sure the big thing, but like the old metal lid of it. Yeah, it's either some reflective spot or something that, it was very easy to fool. And some of like those like, use a refillable Keurig cups that you could just put them in actually came with a little thing to bypass it. I don't think it was installed, because I think that'd probably be causing some legal issues but they could supply you the little thing to put on. <laughs> so, kind of a fun one there. But anyway, um, so most things, as I, my, my notes say, have some sort of embedded computer in them anymore. I mean, at little freaking microchips. It's, it's kind of crazy. Next, we go into convergence. This is the integration of technology on multi, multi-function devices. Take your cell phone, for example. All right, did any of you have what I'm gonna call the candy bar cell phone when, they, when you first got your cell phone? Yeah, I feel old now, but, you know. By candy bar, I mean, basically all it did was send phone calls or receive them and maybe text message. All right. I think I got my first phone when I was 16. All right. Um, and, yeah, I had a candy bar phone. And, like, I didn't even have texting at that point. All I had was phone calls. And it had the, the it was the old Nokia phone that had the good snake on it. Oh, those were good days. All right. Um, but anyway. Yeah. Um. Yeah, multifunction. So at that point, it was like, all this does is make phone calls. That's all it needed to do. And then they went, you know, we can, we can add a little bit more smarts to this. We're going to add texting. Okay, now we can add this. We're going to give you a calendar. Now we can add this. And technically, that device probably would have qualified as a for convergence because it probably did have a calendar. It had a phone. could do text. It had some games. So it has a multifunction function device. But it is nowhere as multifunction as our cell phones are nowadays. All right? You can do email on your phone. Web browsing, document editing, music playing, cameras, GPS. Some phones will even work as credit cards. All right. If you ever hear of NFC, near field communication? Many phones nowadays have that built in. So you can actually have a credit card built into your phone. Let me tell you, one of the best things in the world. Don't have your wallet because you forgot to grab it before you left? No problem. Pull your phone out. Tap it. You're good to go. All right. I am a huge fan of the whole world of NFC. Um, Big, big fan of it. So, uh, my watch actually even has it. So, I, technically, I can pay for my watch certain stores. I just wish that all stores would start accepting us. Like, Lowe's does not. Drives me nuts. Like, I just want to use my phone. All right. So, some phones, uh, Martin's actually now does. They didn't used to. Yeah. I used to try it all the time. Be like, no. Nope. I'm like, have the symbol right there. <laughs> tap, on, tap the credit card. It worked fine. But the phone didn't. But um, I used it at actually a giant, which is Martin's like sister store. And it worked. And I'm like, I'm going to laugh if it works at Giant, but not at Martin's. And the next time I was at Martin's, I tried it and it worked. And I was very excited. So that does work. All right. And then lastly, we have the wonderful world of green computing. All right. This isn't for e efficient and eco-friendly use of computers and other electronics. Um, using computers to be more efficient. All right. Uh, one nice example of that would be home automation. All right. Um, it, 
like to even go like way back. Um, programmable thermostats where you could say, all right, when I'm home between the hours of this and this, I want the house to be 70. And then when I leave for the day, you can raise the temperature back up because, you know, when you're air conditioning, because no one's home, so I don't need to cool the house. Um, that would be a green computer there because it is actually saving energy for your house. All right. Home automation is starting to get to the point where they're starting to have like motion sensors and things like that in the room. So when no one's in the room for so long, they just turn the lights off. Now, when you come back in, you have to turn them back on or you have to have it set up to turn, like detect you and turn them back on. But again, saving you energy in the long run. So home automation is trying to get to that point. All right. Uh, not everyone uses home automation that way. I am one of them. I do not turn lights off in rooms and no one's been there for so long because I don't have presence detection. Um, but I do use it for like um, automating lights. It's like, okay, at sunset, just turn the lights on in certain rooms. Even when I'm not home, they turn on. So it makes my life easier. I actually used to disable that when I was home. And I got, to, I'm like, no, it makes more sense just to turn them on when I'm home too, because probably that's where I'm going to be. <laughs> so just turn the lights on. Um, so you also have some smart, smart appliances, all right? Um, some power grids will give you a discount on your electricity if they will let you, let them control your HVAC system within reason, all right? Um, so what they would do is um, when the, the, you know, when it's really hot out, everyone's hitting the AC hard and the power grid can't quite handle it, they would alternate whose air conditioners would work. So they'd say, this, the, all the odd number houses, the ACs can work right now, and the, the even ones won't. Your house is going to get a little warmer at that point, but it's saving the electric grid from having a brownout and crashing. So California might need to get a lot more of these things installed. <laughs> all right. But um, it's really funny because some people signed up for this because they're like, oh, cool, it's going to save me an electric bill. Awesome. And then they forgot about it, and it got really hot. And it was like, why is my HVAC system not working? So and they call the HVAC company, and they come out and they go, it works perfectly fine. You're under control of this right now. And then they get all pissed off. It's like, you signed up for this. I didn't, we didn't make you. So just kind of something to be thinking about. But again, for saving energy, it does make a lot of sense in the long run. All right. Um, so green computing. So the information processing cycle here. All right. Um, we basically have three different, three, four steps, as you want to call it. Um, I guess I've got four steps here. So first we have an input step. So this is, uh, so we take our information. Why is that not showing up up there? Oh, well, that's wonderful. All right, there we go, now you guys can see. So the information processing cycle. So we have input on the left-hand side there. That is taking that raw data, those zeros and ones or the, temperature that you've collected over months or years or whatever the information is. And we put that into the computer. Um, so this could be text that you're typing, numbers on a spreadsheet, whatever. Next we have processing. So the computer programming changes the data into useful information. So this could be using Excel and going, all right, I've got all this data for the temperature. What's the average for the month? And you write a little command and it pops it out. Average for January is this, February is this, whatever the case is. All right. Um, it could be taking a photo and you editing it and it's processing it to actually make it you know, more like what you want. Then we take the output and that's when you actually see the information on the screen. All right, nothing too exciting there. It's just taking the information after it's processed so that way you can actually visualize what is going on. And then we have the, this storage step um, and that's when you're actually saving it. Of course, that's a, if you want to save it. All right. And processing may go back and forth with that storage because it may be accessing data or information and pulling it in and editing it and going back and forth. So that's why you see the storage having the double arrow ended there. But that is overall how a computer works. Um, and I always love it when someone says, the computer isn't doing what I told it to do. It's like, no, it is doing exactly <laughs> what you told it to, to the period. Now, that could be it's not, you have some program, if you actually like, wrote the program yourself, you could have screwed up your program. It's not formatted correctly. You missed a stupid semicolon somewhere. You put a colon in instead, so it looks right, but not quite. And it's erring out on you at that point. Um, but it's doing exactly what you said. And this is one of my favorite things to show my students in my robotics class I teach. It's like, okay, have the robot go from here to here. And it tries to do that, and it runs into itself. And it's like, can't make it. All right, I'll just go to the next step. And then it starts doing something else. It's like, technically it is. 
All right. It tried. It failed. It moved on. Small chance, though, that it doesn't do exactly what you tell it to do, though, because there are bits like every once in a while. Yeah, okay. Technically, there could be one little something that gets screwed up, or with networking, you could have communications issues. Most of the time, there's got a little bit of redundancy in there to check those types of things to make sure there's not going to be a problem. But yes, there could be uh, something that got flipped, and you're like, why does this number add up to 362? And then you rerun it, it's like 48. And you're like, something could have got flipped, yes. But traditionally, it's doing exactly what you do to the T. So just be kind of careful about that is really the, the name of the game here. Um, you never know what is going to happen. Or you should know, but you know, it, it could be a little different. That takes us to the wonderful world of binary. Now, many of you are going to be like, binary? Some of you will know it, and you'll be like, why are we talking about binary? Some of you are going, WTF is binary. Both answers are perfectly fine. All right. Binary is just another basically mathematical system, but this is how computers work. All right. Um, all binary is is zeros and ones. Every piece of information on your computer ends up being zeros and ones at somehow, some way. All right. So if you only have one bit, one binary bit, that is one little space for you to write a number on, that binary bit can be a zero or a one. Those are the only two options. It can be on or off, true or false, high or low, however you want to think about it, zeros and ones. Ones are high, zeros are lows, you know, equivalency, there you go. And that would be the power of 2 to the 1. So if you were to type in a calculator, 2 to the 1 power, because there are two possible combinations, and there is one space, so that's why we get the 2 and the 1 from, you would get 2. So there would be two different possibilities. If we had two spots, there would be four possibilities. There would be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. So there are four different possibilities there when it comes to binary. And that's the um, best way to figure that out is 2 to the second power on a calculator. And we could go down the list all the way. But 2 to the 8th, that would be 8 bits. That is also called a byte, a B-Y-T-E. All right, not a B-I-T-E, B-Y. Um, and that is 256 different possibilities. And that is, those are basically the building blocks. Bits and bytes are how com everything on computers are running. When your computer, if you ever write a program and it converts it into co uh, computer language, it is converting the text that you wrote into zeros and ones for it to process. That is basically what it's doing when it's compiling it. Um, so we can we could go down that, that list forever there. But anyway, um, binary is what's called a base 2 system. Our traditional math is a base what? 10. All right. You've got 0, 1, through two, one two, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9. There are 10 different possibilities. That's why if you had one spot, it'd be 10 to the 1th, which would be 10. If we had two spots, we can go from 0 to 99. That's 100 different possibilities. The other thing I really like to point out here, computers like to start counting at zero. Because if zero, zero, you know, all zeros is zero, so that's the first number is zero. And then we go to one, to two, to three, all the way up to, you know, 255. Um, so when I have those possibilities of two or whatever, that's actually, like, for the first line there, it's actually zero and one. Those are the possibilities. Two is never actually a possibility that could be answered, it could be calculated there. Same thing with 256. You only can actually count up to 255 because we start counting at zero. Because we don't want to waste that bit. We don't want to waste that spot. So we're just like, ah, okay, we'll just start at zero. Um, on the left there, on the left-hand side of my screen, I have some prefixes. Hopefully many of you are familiar with prefixes. Prefixes. A prefix is a word, letter, or number placed before another. So in this case, we have words. So if you hear the term kilobit, all right, or megabit. Hopefully you guys have heard the term megabit before. Um, any of you who are responsible for your own internet connections at your homes, um, megabit is actually how your ISP, your internet service provider, is um, supplying internet to you. It's by bits, it's not by bytes. Most computers show your internet speed in bytes. <laughs> Drives me freaking nuts. It's like, all right, I'm transferring a file to the internet. Why am I only getting 10 megabytes? Like, I pay for 100. Well, 10 times 8 is 80, and then you've got a little bit of overhead and everything else going on. So you're like, okay, 80 out of 100 is actually pretty good in my opinion. All right. But yeah, it just drives me nuts. It's like Windows like defaults for transfer speeds and bytes, but like when your ISP sells you it, it's in bits. And obviously that's there to make them look good. It's like, oh yeah, we're 100 megabits. We're not 15 megabytes. 
Megabytes, 15 doesn't sound good. All right. So we have prefixes. So kilo is 10 to the third, which is a thousand. Mega is a million. Giga is a billion. Tera is a trillion. You might also hear the terms peta, exa, zeta, and yada. All right. Um, when I've talked about computers, like you know, watching YouTube videos and all the other fun things, I've heard up to petabytes. I've never heard zettabyte or exabyte or, or yottabyte. All right, petabyte is probably about the top one that I've heard. Um, and truthfully, in your life, as long as you're just dealing with your home network and things like that, pet, uh, terabyte, that'll be plenty for you. All right. Um, I have a four terabyte hard drive at home with all of my music that I've had since I was a kid and had access to a computer. All of my photos from 2003 and on, I think. All of the videos that I could ever, you know, really need. Um, and uh, still not even like half full on that ter those four terabytes. <laughs> so from, you know, what, 20 years now I've been collecting data and I'm still only like half a uh, t two terabytes or I'm only at two of my four terabytes full. I think, you know, four or five, eight, ten terabytes will probably do many of you perfectly fine. Now, if you go into the world of YouTube or you're really photo editing or graphic design or whatever the case, all right, then uh, then maybe you're going to need some more, some more data storage. All right. But for most of you, like a four terabyte hard drive will probably, um, your data will out, your availability will outlast the hard drive itself. That hard drive will fail probably before you fill it completely. All right. So just kind of one of those things to keep in the back of your mind. Um, many of you will have like a one terabyte hard drive in your computer. Um, like especially if it's a Windows or like a Mac, you're looking at like 500 plus gigs or a terabyte. It's kind of like the default anymore. Some of them are now on a 256, but for the most part, like a terabyte uh, spinning disk, spinning rust, as some people call it, is kind of like the go-to. Now, sorry, I'm going to take a hop back here. Going back to the world of binary. Any questions? Not yet. Okay, cool. Um, going back to the world of binary and bit bytes. All right. So one byte is eight bits. All right. Um, we used to have, what's, um, well, we, we still have it, ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, -I, all right? Um, this is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, all right? So I don't have any good examples. I don't think the next slide has examples, no. Nope. Um, but it used to be, like, if I would send you the number 52 over serial, and we took 52 and converted it to zeros and ones and highs and lows, and we sent that over a connection between two devices, the other device would receive that 52 and go, oh, that's the letter P and then it would show P on your screen. That is legitimately how like a P in a Word document is formed. It's 52, or whatever the magic number is, I don't actually know what that is, don't quote me on this, um, in zeros and ones in a text document, basically, in a binary file. And the, everything in the US basically just knows, okay, that number represents this letter. Getting ahead of me, but yes. <laughs> All right. So it was a seven-bit system, which meant 128 different possible letters. Um, I don't know when we changed, um, but seven-bit allowed us to have both uppercase, lowercase numbers, punctuation. So for your average thing, plenty fine. Then we went and said, you know what? Seven-bit's not quite enough anymore. We've got too many symbols and things going on. So we went up to 256. We went up to an eight-bit ASCII. All right. Um, so that's how we used to do it. Now, depending on your system and what you're doing, um, it could still be ASCII, um, especially things that are doing like serial communication. ASCII is still kind of the go-to because normally you're sending traditional symbols and things, so you don't need the extended. But we also now have uni Unicode, which extends ASCII and um, contains codes for over 100,000 characters. <laughs> All right. So we went from 256 different possibilities with ASCII, and now we went to Unicode, which has... 100, over 100,000 characters that we can store. Now, for us here in the US, 256, perfectly fine. If you go to, I believe it's like a Chinese keyboard, they have so many different symbols, like combinations of their things, 256 was not enough. So I actually had to like develop Unicode for that type of situation. So that is why the Unicode is important. Um, yeah. And then as you were talking about compression, yes, all right. Um, the first time you type a letter, it's going, okay, this, and then that, you know. And the whole goal here is to save as much, how many, as many bits on your computer as you can. Um, and this is where you have to get a little careful, because you can compress things too much. Right? In theory, every time you compress something, you're actually losing data. Now, technically, that data should come back when you uncompress it. Um, but if you ever hear somebody saying, hey, I zipped all my folders, 
together. You know, I saved five gigs. Okay, cool. And then I zipped all my zips together and I saved another five gigs and I zipped all my zips, zips, to, you know, and they just went and they're like, yeah, I saved a hundred gigs by doing this. And like, cool. All right. And as you uncompress things, all of a sudden your pictures have artifacts in them <laughs> and your videos don't look right. And your audio doesn't sound right. It's because we constantly are compressing. All right. Compression is twofold. One, it's removing information that's not necessary. So like for a music file, WAV versus MP3. WAV files, a lot larger of a file. MP3, much smaller. Now they kind of said, well, we don't really need this information in an audio file. So we're going to take off the really highs, take off the really lows, kind of ignore that data, and we're good to go. Most people, they don't care. <laughs> All right. You get to audio files, and they're like, how dare you listen to an MP3? <laughs> I use records. <laughs> All right. Um, and it's because they, that, extra that extra audio that we cut off in those MP3s by compressing them is missing. So you don't actually get that true sound of that file. So we do need to be kind of careful about compression. And yes, compression does work with like text files by saying, oh, you've typed P 800 times. Instead of writing out whatever the Unicode or ASCII code for P is, we're going to make that one zero. And every one of those in there, we're going to just make one zero. So instead of having to write out an eight bit thing, we now have two bits. And if you wrote it 800 times at eight, you're saving six bits per P. That's a lot of bits that you're now saving. All right, that's 4,800 or almost 5,000 bits. All right, and if we're talking about 100 megabits per second, that's 50 seconds of transferring that data file that you just saved yourself. So compression is obviously important, but we do need to be careful about it. All right, the evolution of the computer. All right, anyone recognize what's in the top right-hand corner there? Anyone feel like they're taking a test and they're punching out letters? We'll come back to that one. Anyway, um, so the analytical engine. This was first designed by Charles Babbage back in the 19th century. All right. Um, it was a mechanical computer that designed that relied on punch cards. So that is what you see in that top right-hand corner. Um, I don't want to call my parents old, but my mom remembers making programming on punch cards back in college. All right. Um, so that was, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, somewhere around there ago. Not that long ago, that was how you'd write a program to process your data. You'd write a punch card, and then you'd write another punch card, and another one, and you would feed these things into the computer, and it'd go, oh, there's holes here, that means this. Oh, there's holes there, that means do this. Could you imagine trying to do that? Get a little hole punch out and go, just kind of punch away at a little piece of paper and then feed it into a machine. All right. Man, I, I am so glad that I can just type on the keyboard nowadays. <laughs> All right. Um, this is much like a Jacquard loom, which manufactured textiles. So um, if you're trying to make a big blanket or whatever with a loom, I believe those also could run off punch cards to define colors and things like that um, from way back then. But he started to design a computer that would do this. Um, and Ada Lovelace was the first computer programmer who wrote a program for this computer. Unluckily, the technology to build the computer wasn't actually available when this thing was designed. <laughs> so this guy came up with this plan, but he couldn't actually build it because the technology to actually build it didn't exist. All right. Um, so they could not be tested until the late 20th century. It did actually work, though. That's the amazing part. I always love when you see something that's built from old plans and it actually works. It's like, holy crap. That is so impressive. Next, we go to Alan Turing, which was 1936, and he developed the concept of machines, and, um, and this was called the Turing machines, and this was them performing mathematical computations. So basically, us doing math. Then we move to the 1950s with the Turing test. Anyone ever heard of the Turing test? Yep, one person. All right, the Turing test was basically was there to determine a machine's ability to display intelligent behavior. Basically, we're talking about artificial intelligence here, all right? Um, it's like talking to her, you know, on the phone. You call 18 to you, wherever you're off, and there's this nice woman on the other side saying, hey, how can I help you today? And you're like, balance do or something. And it understands what you said. And it's like, I understand you said this. Is it one of these possible options? And, you know, it's like, and you're just like, give me a freaking person because you don't understand what I'm saying half the time, all right? I actually really miss the number pad when they just could give you options. It's like, no, I don't want to hear the freaking AI trying to listen to what I'm saying. 
just let me hit a button on the keyboard because it will not misinterpret a five. All right. Um, but yeah, so the Turing test was that. Um, so this led to the concept of artificial intelligence, which is a branch of science where computers display human-like behavior. This idea of a test, the Turing test, is actually still used today. As all these companies are trying to create artificial intelligence and things like that, this is still trying to figure out, um, still used today, is trying to figure out how much intelligence is there. Um, Google actually recently, one of their employees claimed that they they created a sentient a sentient computer program device. Um, Google denied it. Who knows what's actually happening in the background there, but um, that's what's going on. Next, we go to the first generation ENIAC. Um, this is the electric electronic numerical integrator and computer. This was built in the 1940s. All right. Um, this used vacuum tubes and manual switches to process data. All right, here's my favorite part of this. The first generation computer for this weighed almost 30 tons. All right. Way back when, this whole room would be one computer that's in front of you. The entire room would be filled with hardware to be as powerful, or probably, remember, where is that? Nowhere near as powerful as your cell phone, probably. All right. Your cell phone has more power than this entire room back in the 1940s. Think about that. All right. 30 tons. One ton is 2,000 pounds. We're talking 60,000 pounds. I would put money on the fact that this floor would not support that. <laughs> All right. Um, next, we move to second generation trans transistors in the 1950s. So we're actually constantly shrinking things. So we went from these vacuum tubes, which I should have had pictures on the screen of, which were glass tubes. Um, you can still buy some vacuum tubes. It may be, depending on how old and everything, you know, one, two, three, four inches in diameter and tall, vacuum pulled out of it with electronics and everything happening inside of it. And that was a switch. So that could either be a zero or a one. And when something would go bad, you'd have to figure out where that thing, whichever one of those vacuum tubes went bad, and you'd pull the, that thing out and you'd shove a new one in its place. There's an actual socket for you to plug that thing into. Kind of crazy. All right. Um, Adams, I think Adam Savage has one, like a collection of, of bits and bytes from the ages. And it's like this kind of interesting like tray that holds eight of these vacuum tubes on it. And that's one byte of information right there. And they would actually, re could replace that whole tray at once. There's actually like a handle on it so you could plug it in or out of the computer if something went bad. So if they were like, oh, that byte's bad, they would just go replace it. And they could test each bit individually to figure out which one was bad. And they could re then replace that one bit. So, um, but yeah, so we're starting to get smaller and smaller. Um, I don't have it. Okay, integrated circuits. Third generation, integrated circuit, 1960. Integrated circuit, that's also might be, might, might have actually heard it called an IC. All right. Um, these contained tiny transistors integrated into the silicone. So that black chip up on the screen, that bottom picture, that is an IC. All right. That has transistors in it. And those transistors are basically the equivalent of one vacuum tube. <laughs> One transistor, one vacuum tube. That little black chip could have millions of millions of transistors in it. So there's a lot of activity happening inside that little itty bitty chip nowadays. Um, that is basically what your CPU is. The whole bunch of transistors going on and off at super high speeds, which create heat. That's why we need to get our heat away from our computers. Um, this led to the third generated computers in the 1960s. They were smaller, faster, and more reliable than any of the previous stuff dealing with um, Trans just transistors or the vacuum tube, those types of things. Yeah. All right. Um, and that led us to microprocessors, which also is that little black chip there. But this contains all of the circuitry needed that the computer needs. So this isn't just the processor. This is also some RAM and some memory and whatever else it is that that computer would need to run. Could be voltage regulation or whatever the case. So we've gone from integrated circuits, which just have little transistors built into them, to actual microprocessors. And this is basically what's running all of your stuff today, microprocessors. Um, they're just small processors. All that's micro, small, right? Um, and this takes us to Moore's Law. All right? And Moore's Law is an observation that the number of transistors that can be put onto an integrated circuit would double roughly every two years. All right? So every two years, they've basically halved the size of a transistor. Which is why, if you would ever look at a computer, back from when I was in college, back in 2007-ish, uh, my first desktop, I mean, let's go back farther. When I was in high school, I had bought a laptop. It was a single core, 
2.4 gigahertz processor with 512 megabytes of RAM. And man, let me tell you, I was feeling high when I got that bad boy. It's what I called a desktop, uh, portable desktop because it was a 17 inch laptop with a full keyboard, including a number pad, and it was probably an inch and a half to two inches thick. Not the type of thing that you want to carry around with you daily, but when you had to take it somewhere, it was wonderful. All right, um, so that bad boy, yeah. So that was, well, 2003, 2007-ish. So I went to college in 2007, my parents bought me a desktop. I actually bought the laptop myself, all right. Um, the desktop had a quad-core 2.4 gigahertz processor. So I went from a single to a quad. So I quadrupled my processing power. I also went from 512 megabytes of RAM to three gigabytes of RAM. So I hex six times multiplied my RAM. That was in four years. Probably not even, because I did probably not buy my laptop when I was in you know seventh grade or eighth grade. No, it's probably like 10th, 11th grade. So like probably like two years, quadrupled. Now that was laptop to desktop, so that obviously plays a difference. But still, it's just crazy. Now, if you look at like some of AMD's Threadrippers, and it's like, oh, we've got 64 threads at 4 gigahertz or something like that. Yeah, I, I didn't know what the newest version of AMD was, or, or what the specs were. I knew that it was recently coming out, or at least the details were, were releasing. But just, I knew Threadripper had like 30 or 64 cores, and it was like, like 3, 3 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz range. So like, 64 freaking cores, and that's probably hyper-threaded to 128. Like, my little quad-core desktop from 2007 looks like a, I don't know, a turd on the floor at this point, all right? So, we've just, like, we're skyrocketing here with Moore's Law. Um, now, the question, question is, can we keep up with this? All right, we're getting to the point where the transistors are nanometers. Um, if you ever hear them talking about the process of manufacturing ICs or processors or things like that, they're talking about like a five nanometer process or a seven nanometer process. That is the process for them actually making the, the CPU. So they keep pushing and they're trying to keep shrinking that nanometers down and down because as they shrink that, they shrink the transistor size, which is really impressive. But can we keep up with this doubling every 18 months to two years? That's a big question that nobody really knows. Um, we're starting to kind of hit a, a limit with heat in the, in the ICs. It's like, okay, yeah, we can keep shrinking these. We can keep shoving more ICs, but how do we get the heat out? All right. Um, if you look at you know, like your standard CPQ cooler, it's not a whole crazy. It's the metal fins that you stick on the top with some um, heat uh, heat transferring paste. And it's like, okay, we're going to water cool this because we need to get all the heat out of there quicker. And if you go to some like the extreme crazy overclockers, they're using frequent liquid nitrogen to get the heat out. And it's like, okay, there's basically liquid nitrogen sitting on the CPU itself, all right? But the chip is still getting hot because even that liquid nitrogen, as cold as it is, can't get that heat away fast enough, all right? So kind of crazy in that aspect that we're just, we are getting so much density in such a small size that we're having heat issues. So heat is the going to be the real limiting factor here. Yes, we can shrink the transistors more. We could make everything run faster, but if we can't keep everything cool, well, then we got a problem. All right, so just kind of one of those things to think about. All right, and this will be the last slide for today. Um, and again, it did not update. That's lovely. All right, so personal computers. All right, um, we've already talked about this to some extent, but I guess I'm going to have to a quick pause this. So personal computers. Um, as I said, there are some different options here, but most of you will probably be laptops, right? How many of you guys own a laptop? Most of you guys have a laptop. Who has a desktop computer at home? Actually, a good fair bit of you. All right. Who has a tablet at home? Okay. Got, got a, lot of, a lot of devices going on. All right. Anyway, <laughs> laptops, also known as notebooks. All right. Now, there is some weird terminology going on here, in my opinion, when we're dealing with um, the textbook for what it's talking about. All right. But anyway, notebooks, laptops, overall, same exact thing. They are traditionally going to run on batteries. All right. I guess technically you could have a laptop without a battery to be plugged into the wall all the time when you're portable with it. Doesn't sound super enjoyable to me, but technically it could work. 
Maybe you just want a small device to take with you places when you don't need it to run off batteries. So you just want to plug in the wall. That will be better because you're not going to have a battery that's going to blow itself up. So definitely a win there. It's going to be lighter weight, more, more cooling capability, whatever the case is. Um, um, and these technically can be as powerful as a desktop. All right. Traditionally, they're not quite there. All right. Yes, technically, you could get a full-size CPU and a full-size graphic card and a laptop. They're going to be some pretty chunky boys, probably like my old laptop of being about two inches thick. Or some of them crazier ideas have like external um, water cooling that you can plug in. They are out there, but traditionally, your laptops are not going to be as powerful as the equivalent desktop. All right. The cost of your laptop is also going to be more expensive for the same performance of a desktop. Now, that's twofold. One, size. So we are trying to keep the, the parts smaller. And obviously, we keep parts smaller. That means the cost is going to go up. Two, um, when you buy a laptop, you're also buying a screen and a keyboard and a mouse pad and Wi-Fi adapters and power brick. You know, da, 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 da. So a little bit of give and take going on there. But laptop, for the same performance, spec for spec, you're going to have a higher cost. Um, they do, as I said, have extra features built in. They do have a screen that doesn't traditionally come with a normal desktop computer you're buying. They come with a webcam often built into the top of them. They come with um, Wi-Fi built in. Now, a lot of motherboards for desktops are actually starting to include Wi-Fi because they just know people want Wi-Fi. Um, if you ever have the option to plug something with an Ethernet, do it. Just, I'll end my rant there for now. Um, but they come with Wi-Fi and you know things like that. Memory card readers. Um, I don't know what other else. Yeah, that's about all I'm going to go with for now. Um, so yeah, so they do have those extra features. Now, as part of that notebook laptop, laptop category, there is a thing called netbooks. Now, how many of you actually heard the term netbook before? Might be a little bit before many of your time. All right. These were little stupid little computers. All right. They were like 10-inch screens. Like you have laptop or tablets with bigger screens than these netbooks had. And they were still like an inch plus thick. Um, but they were super cheap. That's because their processing was as minimal as could be. Everything about them was as minimal as be could be. So they were very cheap, but they were fine for accessing the internet. Like if that's all you need to do is like browse, check your email, those types of things. You want a little cheap device to use it while you're on va vacation or whatever. They were perfect. As an actual usable device, they sucked. <laughs> their keyboards were cramped. Their screens were small. Their battery life was okay. Whatever the, you know, they were not good devices. Um, yeah. However, the modern day equivalent would probably be a Chromebook. That would probably be an equivalent to a netbook from back then. Now, Chromebooks have come a long way compared to a netbook. You can get a Chromebook with as much processing power as my laptop that I'm walking around here running Windows. If you're asking the same question that I do, why? I don't have a good answer for you. All right. But it is possible to do that. Um, so a Chromebook might be that, that type. Now, we also have convertibles, which I'm on board with. This is a laptop that can be converted to be more like a tablet. So the screen folds all the way around, either, either to the back, or the screen turns 180 and then folds flat again, so the screen's still out. You're going to have a touch screen on it, those types of things. said, so big fan of those devices. All right. Um, yeah, just big fan of the touch screens on laptops. Now, another term I hadn't really heard until the textbook is a sub-notebook. All right. To me, a sub-notebook is going to be like a netbook. It's going to be this little crappy device. All right. However, that's not how the textbook sees it. The subnotebook, as they're calling it, is they're saying an ultrabook is an example of this. And when I hear ultrabook, I'm thinking high processing power, those types of things, which does not go with the term of subnotebook. So to me, a little weird of wording there, um, having subnotebook with an ultrabook be an example of it. But according to the book, it is. Um, so a subnotebook is a notebook computer that is thin, light, and features high-end processing and video capabilities. Subnotebook, ultrabook. I like the word ultrabook. It sounds better, and I'm sure the manufacturers like that advertising a lot better as well. All right. So that would be your notebook. Next, we have, um, oh, I should have described this in the beginning. A personal computer is, a de is designed to be used by one person at a time. Should have really thrown that definition out right when we getting into this, but I didn't. So, personal computer, PC, designed to be used by one person at a time. All right, so we also have desktops. Many of you actually had desktops. That surprised me. I thought most of you would be in the world of laptops and wouldn't, wouldn't be rocking a desktop. Personally, big fan of desktops. What I have at home, love it. My office, classroom, not this classroom, but other classrooms. I get a desktop from IT when I can. Um, 
but des desktop computers offers speed, power, and upgradeability for a lower cost. That is the big benefit of a desktop, is the upgradeability. You buy a laptop nowadays, some of them, like, you can change the hard drive or the SSD, and that's about it. Yeah, unscrew, pop the thing off, put a new one on, you're done. Some of them don't even have that capability. <laughs> all right, so it's like the Windows Surface, that little tablet, all right? That's actually the middle one on the screen up there, the blue with the blue keyboard. That has zero serviceable parts on it. There is no screws you can take out, take that thing apart. It is glued together. I think technically, if you cut a hole in the back, you can replace the SSD on it, but I don't think anything else. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but that's not that's not really upgrading the hardware on board. That's that's purely like adding a little thumb drive. They're like, we know the storage on this isn't enough, so we're going to give you a little SD card slot to store like files on. That's really what that little slot is. All right. But anyway, so the Surface, no like zero upgradable parts. Um, IT people hate it. But anyway, um, desktops. So you also might hear part of desktop is a workstation. All right. Um, that is often found in business as a higher-end computer, perhaps costing thousands of dollars and might be attached to a network. All right, let's get this straight. Workstation, business, gonna be on the network. <laughs> Unless for some odd reason your company has a reason to keep it off. All right, basically any computer in a business nowadays is gonna be on the network unless there's a reason to keep it off. I mean, hell, your cell phone never leaves a freaking network unless you're in a dead zone. All right, why would your computer not be on the network? All right. Um, Man, the other day I was troubleshooting my computer and I was trying to install files on my Linux server and I'm like, why won't you install? And then I finally figured out that I had, I was playing with the IP address on it, trying to set a VLANs and it didn't have an internet. <laughs> so once I changed the IP back to what should work, I had internet and I could install the file with the command I typed. I was like, stupid Greg, <laughs> screwed that one up. But anyway, desktops. Um, you also might have all-in-ones, which is what we have up in the front of this classroom. Um, or the computer, lovely computers that are sitting in front of you, although I'm going to call those a stretch of an all-in-one. So all-in-ones do have all the parts you need built right into that monitor. So again, what you have in front of you, qualify. Um, what in front of you is not actually a full computer, it's a virtual desktop interface, so that's where the line gets crossed. But in your all-in-ones, some of them you can upgrade, like things like RAM and hard drive. Traditionally, your CPU is going to be probably soldered to the board or is going to be named, need major work to get taken off. All right where your RAM and, C and, and um, mother, uh, hard drive, you can just take the back panel off and just pop them off just like they would, like super easy. So um, do I suggest you guys buying all ones? No, because when the desktop dies, what happens to the monitor? It's right out the window as well. All right, so I am really not a big fan of all in ones. Um, I spend the money, buy a desktop. You can get some really small desktops with really like lots of power in them and it'll, be this little thing that sits next to your computer monitor or even some of them mount to the back of your computer monitor it'll make it like a nice chunky computer monitor but you know you can still do that so that'd be my suggestion for you um all-in-one manufacturers really need to add hdmi inputs to all their devices so when the monitor di the computer dies you can still use it as a monitor um but yeah so that's that all right, um, and then let's go ahead and we'll finish off with tablets. So tablets are mobile devices. All right, obviously if they're mobile, they're going to run off of batteries. All right, now we have multiple forms of tablet devices. You have tablet devices running full operating systems like Windows, and then you've got the traditionally lower power tablets that are going to be running your mobile operating systems like iOS or Android. All right, it really depends on what you need or what you're looking for. All right. Um, for many things, especially on a tablet, uh, probably the mobile operating system is going to do you just fine. I remember the first tablet I bought back when it was my last job. I wasn't even a job. I, was a, I think I was a grad student at that point. I might have been teaching. Um, but I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to teach off this. I'm going to project wirelessly just like I am right now. And I'll be able to have my notes right in front of me so I can walk around. Didn't work out quite like I hoped. But I still am using that tablet today to watch YouTube videos in bed. So um, it still has a life. Not a great life, but um, it still has one. It does not do things very well other than that. I think that was a 2014 tablet when I, I think I bought it used. So, um, yeah, that's it's going on eight years, almost nine years old, maybe. And uh, it's showing its age. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, so, yeah. Full-blown tablets, like with Windows, your battery life is not going to be anywhere near as good. So there's going to be always a little bit of a give and take here when you're picking your device. Do you need higher battery life? Do you need better performance? Do you need... Processing power? Do you need portability? All right. 
give and take is what everything with computers is. All right? And then luckily, as I told you guys last class or two classes ago, as soon as you buy that shiny new computer, it's outdated. There is newer, better technology already in development or already being produced and not being sold yet. All right, so it's always this love-hate game with computer with me. It's like, okay, I'm gonna go buy a thousand dollar desktop, which I did back in 2018. I built it from scratch and I was like, ooh, okay. And it's like, yep. And a few months later, the new graphics cards came out. And now I'm still running a 1060 and uh, 20, no, 30, 3080s are like the new, so 3060. So I'm three generations, two, three generations behind on my video card, which for me, perfectly fine. I really don't need a high-end video card other than for some CAD work and things. So I wanted one, but I didn't actually need it. Um, so it sucks. But anyway, Windows versus Android or iOS, it comes down to what do you want, all right? Uh, one of my favorite things for touchscreens is the pen. Not like the stupid little pen you can go to the dollar store and buy that acts like you're poking it with your finger. It's the interactive styluses, uh, which converts your tablet into like a drawing pad. And for me, that is a very useful feature. Uh, one that I was actually, when I was buying my tablet back years ago, I wanted it to have. Um, in fact, when I emailed IT and said, I'm having issues with my laptop, I didn't know about my battery issue then, <laughs> of not being detected. Um, I went, can I get one of the Surface or the Yoga, which has the pen? Because I miss being able to like circle things on the PowerPoint when I'm walking around like this. Um, yeah, I could, and I can't use my finger. I could try to use the trackpad, but we all know you can't draw for anything on a trackpad. So um, I asked for one with the pen again so I can actually like draw on the screen and things. So, <coughs> all right, we will talk about operating systems and finish this PowerPoint up next class. Uh, all right, let me go ahead.